They're looking at things like call volume, call duration, how many times are you making calls to the same number. And another big factor is crowdsourcing. If somebody complains about a call, suddenly that number is tagged with a red flag. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Our Bite You. Today I am joined with a great guest, Michael Pryor. He's going to be speaking at the upcoming ACA International event on avoiding the call blocking blues. However, today we have a great topic. We're going to be touching on a few things. In the age of calling and carrier blocking, is calling still alive and active today? And more importantly, if you are facing problems around call blocking and labeling, how can you remedy that inside of your business? Michael, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And I think this may be my first time ever on YouTube. So that's very exciting. Oh, even better. It's exciting for all of us then. With that said, since you're new to YouTube in general, if you could just kick us off and for people listening, tell a little bit about what you do for work and just give a little background on yourself. Sure. Happy to do that. So I am a partner at the law firm of Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, Shrek, which is a lot of words. So we just call it Brownstein. We are Denver-based full-service law firm. I, though, am resident in their D.C. office, and my practice for, oh gosh, almost the last 30 years or so has been telecommunications, law, policy, and compliance, which includes Telephone Consumer Protection Act work, as well as, gosh, for the last five or six years, it seems like a constant barrage of new rules and regulations from the FCC on the telecom industry about blocking calls. Happy to chat with you about that issue. Yeah, I've myself, I've been in the industry for about five years working on the telecom side of things. And I have to say my time here, it's crazy how fast it's evolved, but it seems from my perspective, recently in the last couple of years, this problem with call blocking has really just escalated. Can you maybe share some of the experience of what you've seen with that and just where you see the state of the industry currently? Yeah, I know. I certainly hear a lot anecdotally about blocking of legitimate calls. And I probably should preface this to say that when I'm, ta- when I'm talking about blocking efforts, I'm talking about the efforts that the telecommunications carriers themselves engage in in the network as opposed to something you might download on your iPhone, like a a robo killer or something. But in in that, the FCC has just set layer after layer of obligations on these telecom companies to, I kind of think of it as the FCC has deputized them to become the robo call police force. Yeah. And they are under a lot of pressure to make sure that illegal or unwanted robo calls don't get through. And in response to that pressure, I think you do see not only blocking of legitimate calls, but another problem that I think is maybe getting worse, which is mislabeling Mm -hmm. a lawful good call as a spam or scam or something like that, which also, as you might expect, really reduces the possibility of having that call answered. Absolutely. Yeah. It's as a consumer as well. It's, it felt like the pendulum swung from one side for, to the other, because for a while it was nonstop. I was getting those calls of my extended warranty and this, and then I think we've all gotten those calls a thousand times at this point. And then, like you said, more recently, I know for the businesses that we work with, it just seems almost everyone is getting affected by these mislabels being applied to their calls. I'm not sure if you are able to give any insight on this, but for maybe businesses who aren't super familiar with why this is happening to their calls, are you able to share anything about what is leading their calls to being labeled that way? Yeah, I know. Again, I think it's it's the pressure from the FCC. Over the last few years, there's been an evolving level of obligations to block calls either on a discretionary basis or increasingly on a mandatory basis. And one of the key bases and maybe problem areas for this blocking is that the the telecom carriers can partner with what are called analytics engines. These are companies that analyze calling patterns and various other factors to try to identify what they, what presumably are suspicious calls. And based on that, the telecom providers will either outright block the calls or, or label them. And increasingly different enforcement agencies at the federal and state level taking actions against carriers for failing to block calls. All of this puts a lot of pressure on the carriers to engage in this activity. There's no really a downside to blocking a call. 
but there's a lot of downside to not blocking a bad call for these providers. So I think the, the kind of the default seems to be err on the side of blocking or labeling rather than the other way. Likewise, that kind of seemed to be what was the case with us for a long time. We would see, it was like only like the heavy call volume people who were getting labeled at first and then all of a sudden it was the small businesses that we worked with. We worked with a lady, she was like a little chocolate shop and her calls were getting mislabeled. It was like crazy how it just, it really seemed to affect everyone. For those businesses out there who it, I think in a lot of cases, it can feel like they're doing nothing wrong. Is there any advice that you could maybe share for what they could do internally to prevent that from cropping up in the first place? Or is it really just something that's inevitable at this point with the direction that the carriers are going? Yeah, I'm not sure if it's exactly inevitable, but it is hard to figure out what to do to stop from getting caught up in this. There are certain calling hygiene practices that should help reduce this problem when the analytics engines are looking at calls to just decide what might be problematic. They're looking at things like call volume, call duration, how many times are you making calls to the same number? And another big factor is crowdsourcing. If somebody complains about a call, suddenly that number is tagged with a red flag. And maybe that's sometimes how you get these smaller providers that aren't really making high volume calls get, get wrapped up in this. And another thing that seems to be happening at some is in order to avoid these problems, some companies are using lots of different telephone numbers mm. to make the calls. But that in itself is turning into a red flag. And it's interesting, we're, we're hearing that if you use a new phone number that doesn't have a history behind it, the sort of default rule is to label it as spam until it has some history. So the, the factors kind of work against companies, but you could certainly try your best to be compliant with the TCPA, obviously. Don't overcall people and just try to avoid having a bad experience with a consumer that could result in a consumer saying, I don't want, I don't like these guys. <laughs> I don't like these calls. <laughs> Cause then that feeds into these, these analytic engines and gets the call, gets that telephone number flag. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, the consumer reporting is one of the biggest things that we hear on our side as well it, that affects our clients numbers. But I thought what was really interesting you had talked about was the people who are purchasing new numbers. And it's like, you think that you're doing this good thing for your business, you're purchasing a new number to try and get rid of the labels. And then sure enough, because it's it doesn't have much of a reputation behind it, it ends up getting labeled <laughs> because of that. So it's it's really a double edged swords that businesses are facing these days with it. But for again, those businesses out there, they're struggling with it, they're maybe they want to do the right thing. Are there regulatory bodies that like they should be going to? Are there people that they should be talking to potentially find a way around this? Yeah, I know there are some avenues. The FCC requires providers that block based on the reasonable analytics process to actually send a notification to the caller or its telephone company that says, hey, I'm blocking your calls based on reasonable analytics. And that obviously is an invitation to reach out to the entity that's doing the blocking to ask it to stop. And the FCC requires that these terminating telecom providers have a point of contact on their website. And there's a major telecommunications association called US Telecom that on its website has a list of contacts. If you're getting blocked, you should either on your own or working with your own telephone company say, hey, are you getting notifications about this? Let's get a hold of whoever's doing the blocking and try to get our phone number off their bad list. So that's certainly one thing you can do. Another thing you can do, and I think this probably goes to your line of business, is this whole blocking and labeling thing has created a new entrepreneurial sector in the industry that's designed to help people get their calls through or help them get blocks or labels lifted. So that's another possibility is to try to utilize one of those companies. And the problem with labeling is the FCC has left that to the industry. They don't regulate it very much. So there's no sort of mandatory notification around that. I'll say that the FCC is starting to take a look at that and they've got a, actually an ongoing proceeding where some comments will be due, I think they do August 9th. Well, let's start taking a look at the labeling problem and hopefully maybe start figuring out some ways to, to corral that as well.
Yeah, that's that's been something I've been so curious about over the last couple of years. We, again, we saw the pendulum swing so far in one direction where consumers were getting all these unnecessary calls. But it's, again, there's so much burden now on these small businesses to try and correct this problem that I almost wondered if there's any plans to have these larger telecom providers, TNS, First Orion, Hyatt, who are sourcing these labels. But I'm not sure if there's ever going to be something that maybe holds these businesses responsible in a way of not mislabeling so many businesses caller IDs, it'll be, I'm not sure if you know of anything that's happening around that, but it would be interesting to see that for sure. Yeah, I know. Again, I think it's, I think it's right now left to the industry. Now, this big trade group I mentioned, US Telecom, they have their best practices that purport to say that you can actually contact them around mislabeling as well. And they'll lift those. That may, well, whether that happens may depend on which carrier is doing the blocking. And the entities that you referenced, the highest and so forth, they're doing the analytics that's fed into the fed to the carriers and the SEC jurisdiction of the carriers. So they'll reach to the carriers to say, stop it, or make sure you, you're using the right mechanisms to stop it if you're, if you're blocking legitimate calls. So it's just recognizing that there are some avenues available to you and utilizing them. And frankly, if you've got legitimate calls being blocked, you're trying to utilize the the mechanisms the FCC has set up, and it's not happening, you can actually go to the FCC and file a complaint against the carrier. We might start seeing that. But I think it's I think it's ironic that these efforts that purport to help restore trust in the network and get people to answer the phone may in fact be causing the opposite problem, leading to too much blocking and too much mislabeling and calls aren't getting through at all. So I think, I think this is a tough balancing act, but I think more needs to be done potentially to help businesses make sure that their good calls are getting completed and not just swept up in this very robust effort to try to block and, and stop illegal calls. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, for our clients' sake, I hope that something can change a little bit in the coming years. But with that said, looking into the next couple of years, of course, you have the labeling, the blocking situation. We also hear a lot about consumers, like as they get younger, they want digital channels, they want texting, they want email. As you look at calling over the next couple of years, is that going to be a viable channel for them to contact consumers on? Or do you see calling going away for businesses over the next couple of years? Yeah, I don't know. I've always heard that calling is still a really valued method to reach out to consumers. So I don't anticipate that calling will go on the wayside. I know texting is becoming an ever more prevalent way for businesses to communicate. And now the FC has got its eyes on blocking texts yeah. and that great problems. But I would expect to see more of that. There are some potential technologies coming down the road that might help the situation. One is called something called branded calling or mm. called rich call data. Yeah. which essentially allows providers to have their name or logo appear on the cell phone that's being called along with their number. And I might see a number I don't recognize and I won't pick it up. But if I see also that's Joe the plumber calling me, I might say, oh, I, yeah, I was expecting that call. The introduction and implementation of that kind of technology, as long as it can be trusted so that you actually know it's Joe the plumber, not somebody yeah, pretending. Yeah. If you can authenticate that information like you're supposed to be able to authenticate phone numbers these days, that might help solve the problem. So maybe there, there are some technological ways to address the problem, but I think, I think eventually I haven't seen any lawsuits or anyone bringing an action against someone for mislabeling or misblocking a call. Maybe someday you'll see that. But some of the problem is that the FCC has put safe harbors around some of this blocking mm -hmm. activity, and it makes it a little bit harder to, to take action. So we'll see. But I, I think one way or the other, people will continue to try to make calls to consumers. And hopefully, as the number of really bad scamming robocalls, you know, no, no one wants these things to go yeah. through where yeah. they're trying to take advantage of people and steal people's money or personal information. To the extent that those can be targeted and reduced, hopefully the efforts of blocking and labeling can maybe ease up a bit. Yeah, no, I, I think it can almost be a, a cyclical thing. I think maybe calling might come back around and maybe in 
10, however knows how many years, maybe it becomes more popular, popular again. I think to myself about email versus mail, I can skim through my email super fast and I don't look that carefully, but what comes in the mail now, I'm like, oh, I go through everything and I'm excited to see what came in the mail. Maybe that ends up being the same way with calling in the coming years if they can get the bad actors under control and maybe it's just the good stuff that sticks around. It'll definitely be interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, maybe it's generational, right? In my generation, where we grew up making phone calls, other ge new generations grew up with texting and chat and those avenues of communication, and maybe they're less interested in receiving phone calls. So maybe, maybe for that reason, calling might diminish as a way of communication. But I think I do think that these other avenues are, are like I said, becoming much more prevalent, and we'll, we'll see if problems emerge there in terms of util utilizing those kinds of, of communications channels. Yeah, absolutely. Now on that note, one of the things that you had mentioned just a little bit earlier is potentially it sounds like there's might be stuff coming down the pipeline with labels being applied to texting. I'm not sure how much you know about that or could possibly share on that, but I hear so many businesses now, they're just starting to dip their toes into texting, into emailing for the first time. Do you think that in the coming months, coming years, that we're going to see it be just as bad with texting as we're seeing with calling right now? Yeah, I think right now the FCC has just again using you know, dipped its toe in the water of regulation, and it and the one thing it's mandated is that providers, wireless carriers, can block texts that come from illegal or invalid phone numbers. Most of the blocking that's going on in texting right now is done through the private industry efforts with ten DLC, ten mm -hmm. digit law codes, and the FCC kind of really doesn't have anything to do with that. I think. The, that process requires now that just about any business that wants a text has to register with something called the campaign registry. And there's a whole framework that's being built around that. Now, that framework, if companies are able to really utilize it and you get registered and you should have no problems getting your text through. So I think there the focus may shift from what the regulators are doing versus what the industry is doing on its own to regulate uh, texting and using this new sort of 10 DLC as opposed to using the old fashioned short codes. Yeah. People yeah. yeah. yeah it's, there's so many changes happening for uh, the technology these days. And if you're not in the thick of it, it can almost be difficult to keep up with all the different stuff that's emerging around this. But I guess today we'll wrap up final thoughts again for those businesses that are sitting out there for right now listening and they're struggling with call labeling, they're struggling to get in contact with their customers. Final parting thoughts of what those businesses could or should be doing in today's environment. Yeah, I think, as I said, I think a couple of things. Reach out to your own telephone company and say, hey, why, are, why aren't my calls that you're sending out there getting completed and what are you doing about it? If you've got... If you're really having problems, maybe you talk to counsel and say, how do I get this done? Or companies that can help you both track your calls and suggest ways to improve calling hygiene so you can reduce the potential for blocking. I think those are the kinds of things you can do right now. Awesome. Michael, it was such a pleasure talking to you today. You shared a bunch of insight. For people listening, if they're potentially interested in getting in contact, maybe learning about how they can work with your business, could you maybe just share with us where they can find you and maybe what like the ideal person that you guys typically work with is? Sure. You should certainly feel free to, to check out the Brown, Brownstein Law Firm website. You can reach me at mbriar at bhfs.com. I'm happy to look at your emails if you want to contact me. But yeah, and we work with all sorts of companies that are having these kinds of problems. And we also work on the telecom side. So we see both sides of it. And that gives us a little better perspective and maybe a little more insight in how we can help businesses try to get their calls through without getting blocked. Fantastic. Awesome, Michael. Again, we appreciate your time here today. And with that said, that is our Bite